assigning responsibility for this increase between natural factors and man-made CO2. Climate scientists follow a process of elimination. They tend to add up every natural effect that they can quantify and then assume that whatever is left after accounting for all these natural forcings must be due to man. This kind of sounds logical until I state it another equivalent way. Scientists assign a portion of historical warming to man because they can't think of anything else that could have caused it. This is a pretty dangerous assumption to make with something so chaotic and poorly understood as climate. Imagine if astrophysicists took that same approach with natural phenomena they couldn't explain. Pulsars? That must be a man-made effect. Despite the problems with this approach, let's see where it takes us. We'll start with the six-tenths of a degree Celsius measured warming over the last century, and then start removing the causes that aren't man-made, and see if we can get a feel for the size of the man-made portion. The first effect we must consider is uncorrected measurement biases. One of the unusual aspects of temperature measurement is that, beyond random instrumentation errors, the vast majority of biases and errors are all in one direction, higher. Bad locations, poor installations, and creeping urbanization are all far more likely to bias a temperature measurement up than down. As a result, errors can't be just assumed to cancel out randomly as one aggregates measurements. Scientists know this, and so they make adjustments to the numbers. But there are a lot of reasons to believe that these adjustments may be flawed. First, the scientists doing the adjustments at places like NOAA and NASA's GISS actually have, at least until recently, refused to release their detailed adjustment software and methodology. So there is no way for other scientists to try to replicate their work and see if what they did made sense, a gross violation of normal scientific process. But what we can reverse engineer from the data is worrisome. Let's take a look at the surface temperature measurements in the U.S. This data is from NASA's GISS and uses measurements from NOAA's U.S. Historical Climate Network. Both the GISS and NOAA apply a number of adjustments to the data. The green line here represents the yearly adjustments made just by NOAA to the raw data. The GISS makes further adjustments that have the effect of further increasing measured warming. Note the magnitude of the adjustment. The adjustment is more than three-tenths of a degree C, a huge percentage of the total historical warming. This means that a large part of the reported 20th century warming in the United States is not being measured by thermometers, but is being tacked on to the numbers back in the scientists' offices where these adjustments are being made. If we strip these adjustments out and look just at the raw measurements, there is absolutely no U.S. 20th century warming trend. None. One more time, this is with the adjustments, and this is without the adjustments. Of course, this is not to say that all the adjustments are invalid. The time of observation adjustments, for example, are important. But it does say that the noise in the measurement system seems to be at least as large in magnitude as the warming signal we are trying to measure. So do these adjustments make sense? Well, the first thing most of us will think of is the urban effect. Cities are hotter than the surrounding countryside, especially at night, due to effects like asphalt that absorbs far more heat than natural ground, and cars and air conditioners and all of man's devices that, produce all, that all produce heat and are so prevalent in our cities. As cities grow up around measurement sites over time, we might expect measurements to be biased upwards. But the, no adjustments are positive. The implication is that, on average, U.S. weather stations in the last 50 years have seen a cooling, not a warming bias. NOAA is saying that the net effect of cities growing up around these measurement stations and more asphalt and cars and the like has been to bias the measurements cooler. This is very counterintuitive, but it has become an article of faith among strong global warming advocates like James Hansen who leads the temperature adjustments at NASA's GISS that urban heat islands don't significantly bias temperature trends upwards. This is an almost indefensible position, but one which Hansen as well as the UN IPCC cling to. It is indefensible because study after study have shown that cities are hotter than the surrounding countryside. Just watch your local news. It is likely if you live in a city, they will quote nighttime lows that are higher in the city than in the outlying areas. And, if, and it only stands to reason that these biases have been increasing over time as small cities have become big cities and big cities have become enormous. Steve McIntyre found something interesting, using the very study that the IPCC used to prove there was no urban bias over time to warming signals. 
After cleaning up the study's data, fixing miscategorization of sites, he came up with this stark comparison. This chart so shows no real warming trend in the rural data and a very strong warming trend in the urban data. The strong presumption is that this urban trend is due more to urban heat island effects than to carbon dioxide. And it goes without saying that since NASA and James Hansen refused to acknowledge this urban heat bias even exists, it goes uncorrected in their numbers. Anthony Hall has been leading an effort at surfacestations.org to get a group of volunteers to photo survey U.S. climate stations to create a better way to correct for location bias. He has found a few good stations like this one in Orland, California, where the instrument is well sighted away from asphalt and urban heat. But he's found many more that have substantial problems. He has found stations located in parking lots, near buildings, right on busy highways, near air conditioning units, and even just next to a frequently used trash burn barrel. And unfortunately for all its problems, the U.S. Climate Network is the gold standard of the world. This chart is the location of temperature stations where scientists have a continuous 100 years of temperature history. As you can see, most are in the U.S. Most of the rest of the world is either uncovered or have locations in urban centers which are subject to urban heat biases. After all, no one was measuring temperatures in rural China, Brazil, or Africa in 1900. As a result of all these issues, there is a good case to be made that there are unadjusted measurement biases that, when corrected, would adjust measured warming downwards. Of the remaining warming, surely some of it is explainable by natural phenomenon. After all, the Little Ice Age was considered an abnormally cold period, and some of the 20th century warming could easily have been due to a natural recovery from these lower temperatures. As you will note, returning to this graph of 20th century temperatures, at least a third of the 20th century warming occurred before 1945, when the impact of fossil fuel burning was still low and CO2 levels had yet to really accelerate. But in fact, there are several other aspects of the 20th century temperature history that don't fit the greenhouse gas theory. For example, the greenhouse theory tells us that we should see the most warming in the lower troposphere, the lower 10 kilometers or so of the atmosphere, and that this warming should be higher than that on the surface. This makes sense because it is the troposphere in which greenhouse gases are absorbing radiation, and we would expect only a portion of this extra heat to be transferred back to the surface. But in fact, observations by satellite and radio sonde balloon of tropospheric temperatures shows exactly the opposite relationship. Temperatures in the troposphere, since we have been able to measure them by satellite, have risen slower than those on the surface. This may be due to an upward bias in surface temperature records, as we discussed previously, or it may be due to natural forces warming the Earth separate and distinct from, from greenhouse gases. For example, an increase in the sun's output would be expected to warm the Earth's surface faster than the troposphere. But this is not the only oddity. One of the ways folks like Michael Mann dismissed the historical data for the medieval warm period in the naming of the large island Greenland and not glacier land is to say that the medieval warm period was just a local phenomenon in North America and Europe. But one might argue something similar for the warming period over the last decades, because it turns out that using satellite data records since surface coverage in the southern hemisphere is so spotty, there is a huge discrepancy between warming trends north and south of the equator. And since CO2 mixes quite well and quickly worldwide, this disparity between north and south is totally inconsistent with greenhouse gas theory. It has caused many to suggest that perhaps the warming trend is as much a cyclical natural effect in the northern hemisphere as it is being caused by greenhouse gases.